morning, good morning, church. How y'all doing? Hope you guys are enjoying your weekend and also some plans that will be going on in um, this evening as well. Um, today, um, I will be continuing the series um, in Psalms. And if you don't know me, my name is Daquan. I'm the student pastor here at Crossroads. Um, appreciate you guys. Appreciate you. Students always on my back. Students always on my back. I need you guys' back throughout the whole sermon. Um, I oversee 6th through 12th grade, and I have the awesome opportunity to disciple students, to hang out with them, and to pour and invest into their lives. Um, today, um, I want to say it's a pleasure to be with you all today, and I just want to give honor to our pastoral leadership, Pastor Marcus and the pastoral team, um, who disciple me, who pour into me, who correct me, uh, who punch me sometimes, but, um, uh, but who invest in my life so that I can be before you all today delivering the word. Um, as we're continuing our, in our time um, in Psalms, you know, what happens is, is that week of, although you have a scripture prepared and although, um, you know, as the pastoral staff, we have planned out each and every one of the scriptures we'll be preaching throughout this series, you have to ask yourself at the beginning of the week is, Lord, um, what would you have me to say? In the light that is of all that's going on, what would you have me to say? As a lot of us in this room are experiencing and maybe grief and maybe pain and maybe fear of what happened um, just, you know what I mean, just hours away of a drive um, at an elementary school. I'm asking the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to say today? As some of you guys are in the room or um, mem giving memory to someone who have laid their life down the line of duty, I'm asking, Lord, what will you have me to say today? Of those who are experiencing various troubles and sufferings and things going on in your very personal life right now, Lord, I'm asking, what shall you have me to say today? And before we go into our, our time, the text that we're going to um, be studying and, and preaching on, I want to share a quick word. In the light of evil and tragedy, what do you say to those who are grieving? And truthfully, when you are grieving too, what do you say? This is a time where we may run for every solution and every answer to seek peace and strength in this time. But today I want to give some simple truths for us to hold on to. That although on this side of heaven you might not have all the answers or the solutions or whatever it may be, we have truths we can hold on to. The very first truth I want us to know is that um, in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, it says, weep with those who weep. We must know that it is good to grieve. That grieving does not show weakness, it shows humanity, it shows compassion, it shows care. It is good to grieve. In so much that our very own Lord, Jesus, grieves. We must know that we have a God who grieves. Jesus is described as a man of sorrows acquainted with grief in Isaiah 53. That we must know that grieving is a part of godliness. That something is going on right now of where it should not be or not should be going on. There needs to be a change or something must happen. This is a grieving process. And know that this is a good thing. But thirdly, we must know the most important truth is that we have a God who will end all cause of grief. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. In verse 4, verse 4 says, He, He, God, will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And He who has seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, He said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and are true. We must know that even in the midst of our pain, we still have a promise. And we must know that this promise, this hope, is granted to those who have repented of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ. That this is why we must share the good news of Christ because he is our only hope. He is everyone's only hope. So we have work to do. 
not only to preach the gospel, but also to be a beacon of hope wherever we are, at our schools, on our workplaces, and our families, and all those who are around us. And what's beautiful about the book of Psalms is that it gives account and it gives a voice to all of those who are the saints in the Old Testament who have went through process of suffering who have experienced pain, who have experienced loss, who have experienced complaint, who have experienced even the deep longing of this is not right. As we're journeying through the book of Psalms, we're going to see that there is a psalm for every season. There is about six different types of psalms. One type of psalm is a hymn, where it praises God of his qualities and attributes and actions. A second type of psalm is lamenting. These are psalms of complaint and misfortune, of where people, the saints of God, bring their complaints, bring their arguments to God. The third one is royal, where they speak of kings and God's kingship. Fourth is thanksgiving, where you speak of your troubles and the Lord's deliverance and provision. The fifth one is the wisdom. These are psalms of warning and teaching and description of the Lord's ways. And the last one is the psalm of ascent. And this is the songs that, the, that Jerusalem and that those of the Jews wrote, that they sung in the car ride on the way to Jerusalem. As they were journeying through the long, harsh desert, they sung these songs of the faithfulness of their God. So today in Psalm chapter 29, verse 1, we have, we have a hint of two types. One, a hymn that praises God's attributes and his, and his actions and his qualities. But secondly, a song that relates to his kingship and his sovereign authority. So you have your Bibles with us today? We go to Psalm chapter 29, starting at verse 1. Psalm chapter 29, starting at verse 1. If you have arrived, say amen. Amen. Psalms 29 verse 1 says, Ascribe to the Lord. Give to the Lord. O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Once again, give to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. Verse 10. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people, and may the Lord bless his people with peace. Let us pray. Lord, in this time, in this very moment, speak, Lord. Your very voice that calls all things into obedience and is subject to you, Father. Speak enlightenment, speak understanding, speak truth in this time, Father. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to speak to me, speak through me, and speak for me. Lord, we are grateful for your word, and we're grateful for your powerful voice. And the saints say, amen. Amen. You know, I'm at an age now, I'm about 27, um, and this is an age where your parents can look at you and see how you turned out, right? Uh, You know, high school, man, high school is high school. You you don't know what you are, what you're doing, and where you're going. And then college, you don't know what you are, what you're doing, or where you're going. And once you get around, you know, the the older 20s, you know, past the midpoint, you realize that I don't have school to be a clutch anymore, um, but I have to, like, have real responsibilities. Like, I have to take care of myself and all these things. Um, And 
as I was looking upon yet like my life and where I'm at right now, I had to take, you know what I mean, just look back to how I grew up, where did I start, how did I become who I am today? And as I took an account of of my upbringing, um, I realized that I did not grow up in a godly family, nor did I have godly friends, nor did I have a godly community around me, which means that everyone around me um, believed ungodly things and did ungodly things, and I took part of that as well. And as I was thinking upon just the things that we're in bondage of, the sins, the anger, the violence, the, the, the lust, the drug, like all of these things. If I'm thinking of the things that we have bondage in, and all those who are around me, I look back and fast forward, why am I who I am today? When I still have friends in bondage of these things. When I have friends who have lost their lives to these things. Why am I, who am I today? Why am I who I am today? And my mom, she, she um, gives me a, a weekly call, you know. And ever since I was little, I knew that I must answer this phone call due to fear. So that has just carried on into, you know what I mean, now my young adulthood. Um, and I remember just thinking upon things going on in my family and my friends and all these things. And I had to tell my mom, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifices that you have made. Thank you for the hardships you had to endure. Thank you for all the things that you had to do to get me to the place where I am now. And my mom, with much wisdom, said, um, Daquan, um, I was dealing with stuff too. I was dealing and experiencing things just as you were. The only, why, the only reason why you are where you are today is because I was praying for you. And this psalm, it talks about ascribing, it talks about giving credit to the Lord. That we must, in this psalm, understand that we have a part that we must give credit, give strength, give glory, give the results to the Lord. This is what this psalm is reminding us today. That no matter... What happens, no matter where you are today, no matter what you are experiencing, the Lord is and has always been in control. We must know that we can trust the Lord. If you get anything from today is that the main point, the main idea is that we can trust the Lord. We can trust him in times of hardship and in suffering. Not only because of his character, but because of his glory and majesty and the works that he has done. So in verse 1, it tells us this. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Is worship the Lord and the splendor of holiness. This is reminder after reminder after reminder that we must give him recognition. That we, no matter what season we're going through, no matter what um, suffering that we may be experiencing, that the Lord is still good. That the Lord still has strength and glory for us to give him credit for. That no matter what we're experiencing right now, if it wasn't for his strength, it wasn't for his glory, we will be in a much worse circumstance. A scribe is used three times in this, in this text. And it talks about to, to give, um, to go to, to bring, for us to remind it that in all times, regardless of the circumstances, we must give something to God. It is giving him to do credit, to do glory, and to do respect upon his name. You know, it's, it's funny, in, in the midst of prayer, in the midst of you know, us being on this side of heaven, dealing with suffering and dealing with pain and dealing with all these things. We are experiencing these things each and every day. Scripture that I spoke of talks about when Christ comes back to redeem his church and redeem his bride. But right now on the side of heaven, we have suffering, we have pain, we deal with loss, we deal with hardships, we deal with all these things. 
And even in the midst of this, we have something good to say about God. The question that we must ask is, what am I giving the Lord? Am I giving the Lord credit and respect upon his name? Am I giving him the glory and strength due to his name? Now, let's define glory a little bit. As of whatever it is good in my life, whatever it is great in my life, whatever gives me peace, whatever gives me joy, whatever gives me any means of of solace in my life, that that is accredited to the Lord. Talk about strength. No matter how we're breathing right now, that, that is a strength accredited to the Lord. That we, can, that we can walk in holiness, that is strengthened to the Lord. That we can be at our jobs and be a good witness to Christ, that is strengthened to the Lord. We must accredit all these things to the Lord. What am I giving the Lord credit for? And how am I giving it? What I love about verse 2, it talks us a little bit about the posture of how. We give this credit to the Lord. Verse 2 says, ascribe to the Lord, give to the Lord the glory due his name. And it says, worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Worship the Lord in the splendor of, of holiness. We must know that we must watch how we worship. Because it's very easy to believe in God, Right? You know, we go to VBSs, we raised up, people say it on TV, people say it everywhere, believe in God. The hardest thing is to trust in the God you believe in. Because in times of pain, in times of suffering, very often we don't run to what we believe, we we run to what we trust in, right? So we must know that our worship is founded upon trusting in the Lord, in his power. That we cannot worship the Lord unless we see the splendor of his glory. That if if God is small to us, if God is just a a, a nursery rhyme or something our parents tell us, we will not worship him. We must know that the substance of our worship depends upon our dependence upon him. And it says, in the splendor, in the splendor of the Lord, in the splendor of his holiness. Now, this helps us to know a little bit our posture when it comes to seeing God and viewing God and worshiping him. Splendor speaks of his greatness, of his awe, of his power, of his strength, of his, of his salvation, of truthfully him doing the impossible. If we cannot see those things, we will have no trust in him in the times of suffering. And we will run to the various things that give voice in our lives and not to the voice of the Lord. But then it continues to say, in the splendor of holiness. Now, holiness is one of those church words that no one uses really in regular life. Um, So all holiness means is to be pure and separate from sin and have no rival. Which means that in the midst of our worship, in the midst of our trusting him, we must, we must understand that we are being separated what's going on around us. We're being separated from the suffering and things that we're experiencing so that we can worship in his holiness. We can worship in his awe. We can worship in his greatness, in his strength. That in the midst of the storm, we have something to worship in the eye of the storm. This is what it's communicating to us. And as we journey through the rest of the verses, God is going to show how he has authority, how he has power, how he has glory. We must know that we and all that, that, that is created is rightfully his. Our call is to ascribe to the Lord, to give to the Lord. But we must understand that all of creation already does this. All of creation, when the, when, when, when the, when the God speaks, they obey. And you're going to see that when, when, when God speaks and, and, has, and has created the whole universe, it obeys. When God has raised up a tree, it obeys. When God had, had told a bird to fly, it, it obeys. So we must understand the friction that it happens when it tells us to worship in its holiness because the only thing that does not obey is us. 
We must know that our call is to ascribe to the Lord, and all creation already does this, except for mankind. The greatest attribute of God is his holiness. We must know that he is intrinsically perfect. We must know that he is without sin, that although, although that our Lord experienced grief, he is not discouraged. We must know that although our Lord has experienced suffering, he is not dismayed. We must know that the Lord, that the Lord is good and is glorious and he is strong and has strength and he has glory that we can rely upon. In verse 3, It tells us why we can trust him. That we must know that we can trust in his voice. Verse 3 says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. Now I'll stop right here. Um, In the Psalms, um, these were, were interpreted as songs. So a lot of them have a lot of allegory and a lot of illustrations in here. So unless you are, you know, grown up in that day, you won't understand what they're talking about. It says the voice of the Lord is over the waters. In that time and age, the culture viewed the waters as being destructive and being chaotic and as being truthfully, it, truthfully being, being evil in that all that I have, all that I have, if I go across this water, I may be abandoned and be wrecked. So when, so when it says that the Lord is over the waters, it is saying that the Lord is over all chaos. That the Lord is over all means of suffering. That he is over and he is still enthroned. That, the, that even these things must bow to the voice of the Lord. We must see that the God of glory thunders the Lord over many waters. Verse 4, that the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Let's talk about the power a little bit. One thing we believe as Christians is God's complete sovereignty. Which means that a bird cannot fly, a dog cannot bark, or a bee cannot buzz without the voice of the Lord that says so. If we believe these things, If we believe that the Lord is over all things, then we can have trust in him in all things. This is why I said the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Verse 5 said the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. When it talks about these cedars, It's talking about kind of trees that resemble like sequoia trees. Huge, unmovable. That if you have a sequoia tree in your front yard, it ain't going nowhere. So when it it talks about the Lord breaking the cedars of Lebanon, he is breaking the things that seem impossible and unmovable in our lives. That when it talks about how these, that, that the, um, that Lebanon will skip like a calf and Syrian like a wild ox, he is talking about the mountainous ranges around them that were hard to climb, that were, that were, that were taxing to climb, that were immovable. He is talking that the Lord's power is so powerful and majestic that the Lord can have these mountains skip like a calf. We must understand that, 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 that the Lord voice controls everything. We can trust in his voice. Verse 7 says, the voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all cry glory. We must be reminded each and every day, each and every Sunday that we come in here, that the reason why we are here is that for us to ascribe and to give God glory for his deliverance and faithfulness of today and tomorrow. We must know that these verses unpacks his glory and strength. That the things that man cannot tamper with, God has, has a voice and sovereign control all over. You know, me, um, when it comes to sports, I'm not that person 
who watches every single game. I'm that person who comes in clutch during the finals. Anybody in that? Anybody in, in, there you go. I, I, I know we I know we in here. Thank you. Um, and what I love is about kind of the post-game post -game interviews. They bring the player who, man, excelled the most. I mean, triple-double, he came in clutch, he did assists, like he made passes, you know, Steph Curry, you know, y'all you know what it is, you know. And what is strange is that they all say the exact same thing. You know, I want to just thank my coaches and my teammates, you know, because it wasn't for them, we want to make this win happen. I'm like, bro, you had like 40 points, that's half the points, like, you know what I mean? Like, why are you giving them credit for what you have done, right? What's weird is that even in the midst of our culture, even in the midst of truthfully simple morality, when someone is accepting a award or any means of accomplishment, it will be seen as arrogant or stealing something from someone if they attribute all the glory and success to themselves, right? What God is telling us in this time, in this psalm, is that are we attributing all of our success, all of the good, and all that is going on in our lives to him? Is it you? Is it your job? Is it your education? Is it your mama? We must know that we must ascribe all glory and all strength to the Lord. This is what we must be reminded of day in, day out, even in the midst of the storm. We must know that God is both all-powerful and all-loving. We've seen in Genesis chapter 1 that God spoke the world into existence by his voice. But also, God not only just created everything, but he also created man as well. And we must know that by his voice that he created with, all things that were created by his voice are subject to his voice. This is why the psalmists are talking about the big things in their day. Talking about water and thunder and mountains and trees of Lebanon and animals and fire. Because these are all things that, go, that was going on without any help of man. So, so when David is comparing all these things of attributing to the, the, to the Lord of his strength and glory, he is encouraging us to do the same. To give credit to the Lord for everything that we have good and great in our lives. And give credit to the Lord for sustaining you through suffering as well. We must know that God is self-existent. That God is sovereign over all things. He's talking about holiness. It means that God is separate. But in this, you see that he is over the waters. In this, we saw in the scriptures that he desires to be with us. So not only is God all powerful, but he's also all loving. That the God that we serve and that we worship, we don't have to only have to trust him in the midst of our suffering, but we have him in the midst of our suffering. We must know this is why those in the temple cried out glory to his name. Because it is God that is doing all the things by his very own voice. We must know that this glory to his name makes us understand that he is all powerful, that he is in all control, and that he has complete authority of everything that is going on. And... Our last point that we will today is verse 10, that we must know that we can trust in his peace and in his strength. Um, ben, you guys going to come on up? That we can trust in his peace and in his strength. Verse 10 tells us that the Lord sits enthroned over the flood, that the Lord sits enthroned as king forever. Verse 11 says, may the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. The beauty of this, it says, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. That something that is so disastrous, something that affects all, something that is truthfully traumatizing, the Lord is not swept by the flood. 
he since enthroned over it. So although that we are maybe experiencing various things in our lives, and maybe drowning in the times and sufferings of this day, we must know that the Lord sits enthroned in power and full control and full authority over the storm. And not only that, is that he sits enthroned as king forever. Yesterday, today, and forevermore. Do we believe that? That in the past, in your flood, in your suffering, the Lord was still on the throne. And it was available for you to call upon him. Do you know right now the suffering you're going through, whether sickness or suffering or even transitions, that the Lord sits on the throne and he is available for you to come to him. And even in the future, we may face various trials and tribulations. We must know that the Lord is still enthroned as king forever. When we observe the blessing of his strength and his peace, that we must know that when we trust in him, that when we put all credit due to his name, he gives us something. He gives us his very own strength and his very own peace. That in the times of suffering, that in the times of hardship, that in the times of loneliness or abandonment, that he gives us strength for us to carry out the very will he has called us to do. That he gives us peace to have sanity to walk today. And for us in this room today who don't know this Lord of strength and peace, the Lord not only saw us in our suffering and our grief and in our sin, the Lord came down to suffer with us as a man. That man, that God man is Jesus Christ. And he came to, be, to suffer in a manner just like us. So that he can be a high priest, so he can be a God that can sympathize with our weaknesses. But not only our sufferings he came for, but to relinquish the debt and punishment of our sins. We must know that the strength in this peace comes by our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful for being trustworthy being omnipotent, being all-present, being all-knowing, O oh Lord. Lord, it's by your voice, by your voice alone, that anything happens. That all things are subject under your voice. So that I pray for all that are in this room right now, Father, that if they are experiencing a season where they have no strength or they have no peace, that they may know and recognize that, Lord, it is you who is enthroned over the flood. It is you who, are, who is in control no matter what is going on. So today, encourage them to put their trust in you and watch the strength and the peace come. Thankful in your precious name. Amen. If you are here today and you are experiencing suffering, sin, um, turmoil, transitions. Um, as a church, we want to pray for you. Um, this is the time where, yes, we all come here and, 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 and cry glory upon the Lord. But that comes because we all have a story to speak of his glory. So if you are experiencing anything right now, let's have our pastors come on up. Um, if you are a deacon, you can come on up. Um, Deacon and maybe a wife or so come on up as well. Um, as we continue in worship, I want to provide a time for you to seek that strength and seek that peace that the Lord provides. Amen.